that, let me take a few questions, and I'm going to start with Darlene Superville of the Associated Press. Where's Darlene? There she is. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is about the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm what shocked. Re <laughs> what recourse do you have if Leader McConnell blocks a vote on your Supreme Court nominee? And do you think that if you choose someone moderate enough that Republicans might change course and schedule a vote. And as you consider the, that choice and who to nominate, what qualities are important to you and is diversity among them? Thank you. First of all, uh, I want to reiterate uh, heartfelt condolences to the Scalia family. Um, obviously, Justice Scalia and I uh, had different political orientations and uh, probably would have agreed on, uh, disagreed on the outcome of certain cases, uh, but there's no doubt that he was uh, a, a giant on the Supreme Court, uh, helped to shape the legal landscape. Uh, he was, uh, by all accounts, uh, a good friend and uh, loved his family deeply. And so, you know, it's, it's important before we rush into the, all the politics of this to take stock of somebody who made enormous contributions uh, to the United States. And we are grateful not only for his service, but for his family's service. Um, the Constitution is pretty clear about what is supposed to happen now. When there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the President of the United States is to nominate someone the Senate is to consider that nomination and either they disapprove of that nominee or that nominee is elevated to the Supreme Court. Historically, this has not been viewed as a question. Uh, there's no unwritten law that says that it can only be done on off years. That's not in the constitutional text. I'm amused when I hear people who claim to be strict interpreters of the Constitution suddenly reading into it a whole series of provisions that are not there. Uh, there is more than enough time for the Senate to consider in a thoughtful way the record of a nominee that I present uh, and to make a decision. And with respect to our process, we're going to do the same thing that we did with respect to Justice Kagan's nomination and Justice Sotomayor's nomination. We're going to find somebody who is an outstanding legal mind, somebody who cares deeply about our democracy and cares about rule of law. Uh, there's not going to be any particular position on a particular issue that uh, determines whether or not I nominate them, but I'm going to present somebody who indisputably is qualified for the seat, and any fair-minded person, even somebody who disagreed with my politics, would say uh, would serve with honor and integrity on the court. Uh, now, th part of the problem that we have here is, is we've almost gotten accustomed to how obstructionist the Senate's become when it comes to nominations. I mean, I've got 14 nominations that have been pending that were unanimously approved by the Judiciary Committee. So Republicans and Democrats on the Judiciary Committee all agreed that they were well qualified for the position. And yet, we can't get a vote on those individuals. So in some ways, this argument is just an extension of what we've seen in the Senate generally and not just on judicial nominees. The, the, the basic function of government requires that the President of the United States, in his or her duties, has a team of people, cabinet secretaries, assistant secretaries, that can carry out the basic functions of government. It requires, the Constitution requires, that we appoint judges so that they can carry out their functions as a separate branch of government. And the fact that 
we've almost grown accustomed to a situation that is almost unprecedented where every nomination is contested. Everything is blocked, regardless of how qualified the person is, even when there's no ideological objection to them. Certainly where there are no disqualifying uh, actions by the nominee that have surfaced. The fact that it's that hard that we're even discussing this is, I think, a, a measure of how, unfortunately, uh, the, the venom and rancor in, in Washington has, has prevented us from getting basic work done. Now, this would be a good moment for us to rise above that. I understand the stakes. I understand the pressure that Republican senators are undoubtedly under. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that what they, the, the, the issue here is, is that uh, the court is now uh, divided on many issues. This would be a de deciding vote. And there are a lot of uh, Republican senators who are going to be un under a lot of pressure from various special interests and various constituencies and uh, many of their voters uh, to not let any nominee go through no matter who I nominate. But that's not how the system's supposed to work. That's not our, how our democracy is supposed to work. Uh, and uh, I intend to nominate in uh, due time uh, a very well-qualified candidate. If we are following basic precedent, then that nominee will be presented before the committees, the vote will be taken, and ultimately they'll be confirmed. Justice Kennedy, when he was nominated by Ronald Reagan, in Ronald Reagan's last year in office, a vote was taken. And there were a whole lot of Democrats who I'm sure did not agree with Justice Kennedy on his position on a variety of issues. But they did the right thing. They confirmed him. And if they voted against him, they certainly didn't mount a filibuster to block a vote from even coming up. This is the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. It's the one court where we would expect elected officials to rise above day-to-day -day politics. Uh, and this will be the opportunity for uh, senators to do their job. Your job doesn't stop until you're voted out or until your term expires. I intend to do my job between now and January 20th of 2017. I expect them to do their job as well. All right. Uh, let's see who we got here. Jeff Mason. Thank you, Mr. President. Following up on that, should we interpret your comments just now that you are likely to choose a moderate nominee? Would you consider? No. <laughs> okay. I, 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 the, uh, I, I, I don't know where you found that. You shouldn't assume anything about the qualifications of the nominee, otherwise, other than they're going to be well qualified. All right. Okay. Uh, following up, uh, yes. would you consider a recess appointment if your nominee is not granted a hearing? I, I, I think that we have more than enough time to go through regular order, regular processes. I intend to nominate somebody, to present them to the American people, to present them to the Senate. I expect them to hold hearings. I expect there to be a vote. That means no recess. Full stop. And lastly, as long as we're doing this in a row, um, how do you respond to Republican criticism that your position is undercut by the fact that you and other members of your administration who were in the Senate at the time tried to filibuster Judge Alito in 2006? You know, the uh, look, I think what's fair to say is that how judicial nominations have evolved over time uh, is not historically the fault of any single party. This has become just one more extension of politics. And there are times where folks are in the Senate and they're thinking, as I just described, primarily about, is this going to cause me problems in a primary? Is this going to cause me problems with uh, supporters of mine? Uh, and so people take strategic decisions. I understand that. 
Um, but what is also true is Justice Alito is on the bench right now. I think that historically, if you look at it, regardless of what votes particular senators have taken, there's been a basic consensus, a basic understanding that the Supreme Court's different. And each caucus may decide who's going to vote where and what, but that basically you let the vote come up and you make sure that a well-qualified candidate uh, is able to uh, join the bench, even if you don't particularly agree with them. Uh, and my expectation is, is that the same should happen here. Now, uh, this will be a test, one more test, uh, of whether or not norms, rules, basic fair play can function at all in Washington these days. But I, I do want to point out, this is not just the Supreme Court. I mean, we have consistently seen uh, just a breakdown in the basic functions of government because the Senate will not confirm well-qualified nominees even when they're voted out of committee, which means that they're voted by both parties uh, without objection. And we still have problems because there, there's a, a certain mindset that says we're just going to grind the system down to a halt. And if we don't like the president, then we're just not going to let him make any appointments. We're going to make it tougher for uh, the administration to do their basic job. Uh, we're going to make sure that ambassadors aren't seated, even though these are critical countries and that may have an effect on our international relations. We're going to make sure that judges aren't uh, confirmed, despite the fact that Justice Roberts himself has pointed out there's emergencies in courts around the country because there are just not enough judges and there are too many cases and the system's breaking down. So this has become a habit and it gets worse and worse each year. And it's not something that I have spent a huge amount of time talking about because, frankly, the American people on average, they're more interested in gas prices and wages and issues that touch on their day-to-day -day lives in a more uh, uh, direct way. So it doesn't get a lot of political attention. But this is the Supreme Court, and it's going to get some attention. And we have to ask ourselves as a society a fundamental question, is it, are we able to still make this democracy work the way it's supposed to, the way our founders envisioned it? And I would challenge anyone who purports to be uh, adhering to the original intent of the founders, anybody who believes in the Constitution coming up with a plausible rationale as to why they would not even have a hearing for a nominee made in accordance with the Constitution by the President of the United States, with a year left practically in, in, uh, in office. It's pretty f hard to find that in the Constitution. All right. Put in the cash, art, stuff that's not going to be touched by the federal government. They're not fools. How do you think they got rich? They're not going to put up with having to take care of fat, lazy, slovenly niggers. Richard, don't ever call in here again. Don't ever, ever, ever call in here again. Let's just block that number because that's, that's worthless talk.